It's time to accelerate. Hey, friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 676 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record. I have a great show lined up for you today. Joining me is Jeff Shore. Actually, Jeff, I think coming back maybe for the third time on Accelerate. Jeff is the president of Shore Consulting. He's a top-selling author, a keynote speaker, and much more. Now, before we jump into it, Jeff, because we're going to talk about how customers make decisions, is I want to talk to you about a decision you can make, and that is I want you to check out the sales house. Look, we're, we're all looking for the edge that makes us more productive in sales, to be more effective with buyers, smarter about the questions we ask and the solutions we propose. We want to get better at how we connect with other human beings, how do we engage their interest, build their trust, inspire them to take action. Now, this is, this is education you don't get in sales training. I, and I saw this pressing need for sellers through all the work I do. And so, as a result, I created the sales house for those curious and smart B2B sellers who are willing to invest 10 minutes, just 10 minutes a day, to get 1% smarter about sales. So come experience the hundreds of hours of educational courses and content for me and other world-class experts and join in our live coaching hours, our live workshops, our in-person meetups. Come join this movement to get smarter about sales. Now, to learn everything about sales that you didn't learn in sales training, visit thesaleshouse.com forward slash accelerate. That is thesaleshouse.com forward slash accelerate. And you'll take advantage of our special $1 trial offer just for listeners of Accelerate. So we'll see you there. Okay, I want to jump into it with my guest today. Joining me, as I said before, is Jeff Shore, president of Shore Consulting and author of a really excellent book I joined a couple of years ago called Be Bold and Win the Sale. And today we're talking about the shortcuts that customers resort to in their decision making. You know, a key decision shortcut, for instance, could be that easy equals right, right? The easier something is to grasp the writer, quote unquote, writer, it feels. Um, Jeff, talk, we're going to talk about um, likability. Why, how much I like you leads to how much I trust you. Well, we talk about price equals quality in the minds of some prospect and other shortcuts. So you want to stick around. Make sure you check all those out. All right, let's jump into it here with Jeff. Jeff, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure, my friend. Always always uh, good to talk to you. I, I always end up feeling uh, like a little bit challenged after I talk to you. That's a good thing. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, likewise. Yeah. I mean, it's a learning experience, both directions. <laughs> So today, I mean, where are you today? Just so we set the scene. Yeah, I'm, I'm in my uh, home office in uh, Northern California, where it's spectacularly gorgeous uh, right now. Where are you today, Andy? I'm in Southern California, San oh, there Diego. You there you go. I'll be down there in a couple of weeks. So. Oh, you yep. will? Yep. In San Diego? Uh, yeah, actually, I'll be down there Monday for the birth of my second granddaughter. And then we're holding a big event at the Marriott Marquis on the 12th and 13th, um, right there on uh, downtown. So. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. can. I can see it right here from my window. There it is. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Well, you have to come on by. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think I'll be here, but. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, gosh, we're going to talk about decision making. Yeah. Today. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, and specifically, about, you talk about decision making shortcuts. So, tell us what you mean by decision making shortcuts. Well, I think, you know, if you, if you study and, and look and see what, what, what people are saying, what the experts are saying these days about behavioral economics and decision-making theory. Uh, the fact is that there are just too many decisions to make. It's very difficult to make them uh, all, you know, it, it, uh, consciously in the front of our brain. And so we're constantly relying on shortcuts in order to um, make it easier to do that. Sometimes it's referred to as heuristics, but the idea that you know, when 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 I meet somebody for the first time, if I'm a customer and I'm walking into their place of business or into an appointment uh, to talk to a sales rep for uh, for a firm, um, what's happening in my mind? Uh, I'm I'm actually making a thousand decisions all at the same time. Most of them are non-conscious, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm going into that environment, and there's so many things to decide that if they were all in the front of my conscious, my brain would explode. Sure, so I'm just going to rely on on shortcuts along the way. Right. I mean this. Obviously, it fits the the premise that we've seen in a lot of books. You know, thinking fast yeah. and slow, and others sure. about yeah, right, you know, right. System one thinking, your conscious thinking, your habitual thinking versus your right. your cognitive challenge thinking. Right. I mean, I like, so, to, I like to make the sort of the analogy, if you will, is that 
um, if we weren't driven by habitual behaviors, yeah. that we'd be sleeping all the time like dogs, <laughs> right? Because we we would need to we'd be exhausted. We need to rest our brain. Because I my theory is you know with dogs is when they're awake, you know they're paying att- so close attention to us, right? Yeah. Looking for cues and signals and so on. Right. I think it exhausts them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. now I go go right. to sleep. I get it. I get it. I, I don't think we could begin to comprehend the number of decisions that we make on any given day. For some reason, I'm I'm doing this with my hands. I don't know why. It's just, <laughs> You're being expressive. All, I could do it too if you want. Exactly. That's right. But it's all non-conscious. And I, I think that that's what happens with our customers. They're, they do a lot of things that are completely non-conscious. They don't even understand why they're doing them. They're just doing them. Yeah. Well, I mean, there was a study that was done by some professors at Duke that um, or researchers at Duke that I think they found that basically 50% of our actions during a day are habit based, meaning mm-hmm. we're just, just, we're not really conscious of doing them. We're not conscious of making the decision to do them or to act that way. Right. And that's, that's sort of how we survive from an energy standpoint is, you know, we've, we've delegated a certain large chunk of our life to just sort of routine, routinized habitual behaviors. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So, and then uh, I, and what I'm interested in though is that. Zone in between, right? There's the non-conscious behaviors, and then there is the intentionally conscious behaviors. But I think there's a space in between where, uh, like, like one of the things that I'm really getting into these days is the subject, the emerging uh, subject of um, perspective psychology. So, you know, retrospective, looking back, introspective, looking within, prospective, looking forward. What's the psychology of our future? Mm-hmm. When we think about buying something, what we're really doing is we're we're running a mental simulation of what it right. would be like uh, uh, to own, to use, to take part in that product or service. And then we make that decision based on how we feel in that simulation. But we do it like that. I mean, it happens very, very quickly Mm -hmm. where where, where it doesn't take long for us to, for our emotion to kick in and say, uh, yes, I want that. Or no, I don't want that. It it, it happens uh, in our gut and then our brain sort of kicks in to support it or deny it. But, but it's, 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 that's kind of a tweener to me. It's, it's not completely non-conscious, but on the other hand, it's still kind of automatic thought as I go through that progression. Yeah. Well, I mean, I remember reading uh, a research paper and this was you know, decades ago, mm-hmm. uh, that sort of reflected that. The saying, yeah, what they're saying is, is dis- you call it decision making. They were talking about decision making in the context of making a change. So it's still mm-hmm. a decision making. Right. Is that, you know, what most people miss is when they're selling or selling change is this, this idea that one of the c- decision making steps is what you just talked about is this mental test drive. Mm-hmm. And that it's, it's, a step that people have to go through in order to go to the next step in their decision making process is they have to go through this mental test drive. Yeah. And for me, as I, as I read that, I thought, okay, well, how do I incorporate that into how I sell? Mm-hmm. Because I'm a firm believer, and and from stuff I read, is that you know we our decision processes are sort of in a, a linear fashion, and there's certain steps, and people debate how many steps there are. Mm-hmm. But I think people are always sort of in agreement is that you can't skip a step, mm-hmm. right? right? We have to go through our steps in order mm-hmm. and however many we think there are. Right. And so if we don't go through the mental test drive, for instance, it's just you're not going to get any further with the customer. And you sort of have to uh, think about I, this I think like when you, hit, when you hit dead spots with, with deals you're working on, yeah, you almost have to think in the concept of, okay, well, what are they looking for, right? Mm-hmm. What, where's the yeah. roadblock here to get them to the next step? Yeah. Well, and, and and if you layer on top of that, the need to be connected emotionally, or at least to understand what our customer's emotional journey is, that takes it to a whole new level. Because when when I'm when I'm running that mental simulation, right? Let, let's suppose I'm a I'm a I'm a purchasing manager for a big company, and I've got a salesperson in front of me, and I'm imagining what it's like to use their incredible you know software system or their product, whatever it is. I'm running that mental simulation, and then I'm asking that question, you know, how do I feel? But I'm going to make that out of my emotion, out of the gut more than the brain. The brain is there to support it, but deep down, there's that gut feeling. It's almost mm-hmm. like if you're, you know, if you um, if you're in a discussion with your significant other about where to have dinner, it's like, where do you want to eat? I don't know where you don't want to eat, and you're running these you're running these mental uh, simulations in your brain. Well, you missed you, you missed a step there, though, Jeff. What? So, you ask your wife, "Where do you want to go for dinner?" And she goes, 
oh, I don't care. You choose it. And you say, yes. okay, let's go here. And she'll say, no, I don't want to go there. Oh, I don't want to go there. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I do that to my wife as well. Of course, right? of course right? we do. Yes. But, but we're running that simulation and we're asking yourself, you know, how, what do I think about that? Ultimately, we're going to say, oh, that doesn't really sound good. But it's not about sound. It's about what feels good. We mm -hmm. ran the simulation. We asked, does that feel good? So whether I'm choosing a, a place to go to dinner or whether I'm choosing to use this vendor or the supplier or whatever it is, there's still that emotional core that's going to drive that decision. And an emotional core doesn't have any language to it. It's, it's a feeling, not a, not, it's, it's, it's not something that we're, that, that moves into a cognition, but there is sort of that, want, 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 you know, I, I want it or I don't want it. And, and I, I, I feel strongly about it, even though I may not be able to put that into a, a very clear, logical frame of mind. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think the science about emotion and in decision-making is, is pretty settled. I mean, people have done a fair amount of work on it. Right. And, you know, yeah. it's the, I forget the scientist name in, in Italy that did some of the seminal work where, you know, they had this, this unfortunate person whose uh, emotion control center in the brain had been damaged. Yeah. And they were studying this person. This person could not make any decisions. Yeah, yeah. That's the the Phineas well, Gage uh, st uh, study. Yeah, yeah. What, what to eat, what to wear, right. how to turn right. left or right when you leave the yeah. house. So emotions guide everything, right? And, yes. and people have just yeah. have to accept it. That that I remember working for this this entrepreneur who's an engineer, brilliant, brilliant person, and we were trying to sell a, a deal to a really large company. Uh, that we were going to develop a product for them. Mm -hmm. And we went down and I had been working on this account for a long time and it's sort of a really important sort of last meeting, bringing my CEO to meet with their CEO. And my CEO leaves the meeting and goes, well, you know, there's no way we're going to get this deal. <laughs> he said, I don't know why we spend so much time. I said, what are you talking about? He says, they have 300 engineers mm -hmm. in that building who are hired to do what you're proposing we're going to do for them. I said, yeah, and we're going to get the deal. <laughs> it's like, no, no, you just couldn't fathom. I said, because their CEO doesn't trust their internal people that they mm -hmm. can do it in the time frame that we can do it with the, the quality that we could do it. Right. But he was just sort of like, you know, he was an engineer. It's just not, sure. not to <laughs> say anything bad about engineers, but, you know, he was very black and white in the way he examined yeah. things, uh, oftentimes like this. And, yeah, we did get the deal. Yeah, sure. It was, it was but, emotion. It was the, their but, CEO's exactly. emotion. But what are you talking about? Trust. It's emotion. Confidence. Yeah. It's emotion. That's the idea. We and and woe to the salesperson who says, I've got an emotion-driven customer, but I'm going to stay so completely logical that I will not allow that customer even to reach into their emotional core in order to make a decision in the first place. Well, and yeah, it's right. And so it brings up an interesting point about how decisions are made. So yeah, you know, there's a researcher, I forget his name, I think Paul Nutt, maybe, I think. Mm -hmm. Who at Ohio State University, and uh, I've read a couple of things where he's been cited in other books and read some of stuff, his stuff directly, where he says hey, in decision making, there's basically two things that happen. There's like two decisions within a decision. The first one is people decide we're going to make this change or not make this change, mm -hmm. and then having made that decision about whether I make the change or not, we then choose who we're going to make the change with. Mm -hmm. But I think what's happening. I, I I believe that's true, and I I was I had written things about that before everyone was aware of Nutt's work, so yeah. it's nice to be sort of validated in that sure. regard. But but I think what happens though too to a point you were making with emotions is that in the process of educating the prospect about whether they should do it or not, they form a preference, and it's mm -hmm. an emotion based preference. About you know they've gone through the mental test drive, they're you know envisioning what's going to be like to use your product and service. Mm -hmm. So when they make that go no go. At that point in time, there is a leader in their mind. Yeah. And you want to be that leader. Right. Yeah. A absolutely. Uh, uh, completely. And th that level of, uh, of confidence is, uh, is absolutely critical. And, and that's why I think great sales professionals are the ones who can understand the way their customer wants to make a decision in the first place and then tailor to that, right? So when we look, for example, one of the, the key decision-making shortcuts, that's where we started the conversation, mm -hmm. one of the right. key decision-making shortcuts is the idea that in the customer's mind, easy equals right or simple equals right. The, the easier something is for me to grasp, you know, the writer 
it feels uh, to me. And, and the converse is also true that complex equals wrong. When, I, when it starts to sound too confusing, uh, it, you know, that, that the, what's the adage? The confused mind says no. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that great sales professionals do is they may have a complex product, but they, they, uh, they figure out how to simplify. They figure out how to present it in a way that's, uh, that's uh, easy for you to get your mind around. That easy equals right. And I think um, great marketers, great suppliers, they, 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 they uh, draft their entire presentation, their marketing message, their sales presentation, so that we're not overwhelming people. The idea of, of, of dazzling somebody with chart after chart after chart, I, I think those days are, are long gone. Yeah, I mean, so, so two things come to mind when you talk about that. One is, is there's, there can be a danger about easy equals right. Mm-hmm. And, and sort of first example of that is look at the bad hiring decisions people make, mm-hmm. right? Is this, someone comes into your office, oh, I've had a lot of clients and people I work for. This person just looked good, right? They just looked yeah. good in the office. They presented themselves. It just seemed easy, you know, and... But they didn't do the digging. They didn't do the you know the research. They needed to do the in depth interview to find out whether this person really was the right person. Okay, but but let me let me cut in on you because you're sure. I think you're proving the point. The idea here is that easy feels right, easy seems right. It doesn't make it right. It just feels right. Sure. Yeah. So I'm not talking about the the uh, the you know the 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 quality of the final decision. Mm. It's just when I'm making a decision. When it seems easy, it feels right. And so, if we can find a way to provide context to our customers and in, in uh, of our product or service, uh, so that it's easy for them to understand, then that's when the right kicks in. Does, does that make sense? Oh yeah, no, no I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I, to me, there's like degrees of easy, right? Sometimes, sure. if it's too easy, as a salesperson, if it's mm-hmm. too easy, then you know my antenna go up, the red flags start waving. Yeah, it's like. Yeah. You know, it's but I but I understand what you're saying, and I think it's sure. absolutely true. Is mm-hmm. and maybe maybe for me, when you talk about easy, you know, I, I gravitate towards simplicity. Yeah, simple okay, is a a good synonym right here. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, the the more simple you can make things for people, mm-hmm. the easier it is for them to grasp. Mm-hmm. Then yeah, agree 100. percent Yeah, yeah. Um, so next thing you're talking about likability. So yeah. Delve into that for a little bit. This is a really uh, strong connection between how much I like you and how much I trust you. We we all know that so much of the sales process is about forming that trust connection, that gaining the trust of your prospect is so critical to being a good influencer. Uh, but one of the key ways to be able to build trust is to be likable. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is Cialdini, his, his work would talk about this, of his six principles of persuasion. One of them is likability. And the idea is that there's just a mental shortcut. If I like you, I tend to trust you. Now, t- this shouldn't make sense uh, to me. And in fact, this is how con men make their living, right? They mm-hmm. get you to like you, then they get you to trust you, and then they take advantage of you. For the professional salesperson, it's just one of motives, right? But there is no doubt about it. We do have that sense that I like you and therefore I trust you. Whether, you're, wh- whether your aptitude is there or not is secondary to me. Again, it's deep into that emotion. The emotional sense I l- says I like you and therefore I trust you. Yeah, and it, so in his more recent book, Cialdini added a, a layer to that, which mm-hmm. he said, you know, it's not only if I like you, I trust you, if I think you like me, yeah. <laughs> that's I right, trust yeah. you more. Yeah. And right. and I think that's pretty significant when you think about it. Sure. Because, you know, that gets to the whole idea of sort of demonstrating interest in somebody, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is that's why people think you might like them, is you're demonstrating a sincere interest in them. You know, it's, it's not... Right unidirectional you really want to be bi-directional and mm-hmm. and i again agree 100 on this and I, I think this it's a funny you know we've there are people uh you know in the blogosphere supposed experts and you know, it's been some pushback over the last several months you see about this idea of relationships and sales maybe they're mm-hmm. not as important as you think and so on they are yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just FYI, they are extremely important. You know, yeah. you don't you don't get yeah. this likability thing going if without right. in the absence of a, a relationship. Yeah, but I, look, I think if we've been in sales for any period of time, you know, we've all sold to somebody who perhaps didn't like us or didn't have the strongest trust, uh, the strongest relationship. 
But that's a really hard sale. Is it possible? Yes. But it's it's really really difficult, and uh, I, and I don't think it does any benefit to the customer. I think the customer wants to like us. I think the customer wants to connect with us at the end of the day. I don't mean you know it's my new BFF or we're going to go on vacation together. But there's got to be that that bond, that connection, that absolutely that trust. Yeah, we look for that. Well, we look for it. And I think one yeah. of the the gaps that exist currently in the way that we're. Uh, raising, if you will, <laughs> sellers these days, yeah. is we don't educate them on these soft skills. Yeah. Yeah. We train people on process. We train people mm-hmm. on methods. Mm-hmm. But on these critical, critical, critical soft skills about connecting, engaging, inspiring, building trust, we don't. Yep. And nothing happens until those occur. Right. <laughs> right. And they're building a relationship, yet it's like almost completely absent. Or we think, yeah, we'll do some role play and that will do it. You know, role play is is valuable, mm-hmm. but you know, perfecting what words to say in what order through a role play yeah. you know, right. isn't a substitute for being genuine and authentic and, and right. connecting with somebody. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I'm really in recently to this concept of best self. What does your best self look like? And especially in those first 60 seconds, you're getting to meet somebody for the first time. What would it take? Uh, what, what would it do if you were the best version of you that you could be? And and then, as you say, if we prepare people for that, if we really get them to think through, because, I mean, let's face it, that that relationship is won or lost in in, in the first 60, 30, maybe seven uh, seconds that go by. Absolutely. If, if, Absolutely. if we're not fully there, we, we got a problem. Yeah. Well, I think that people don't fully grasp that. And if you're listening to this and watching this, you, you, need, to, you need to understand that deals are won and lost in the first interaction. Yeah, oftentimes, and you're, right. you're not aware of it. Mm-hmm. So if you're not bringing your A game, to your point, if you're not being the best version of yourself possible, mm-hmm. then you're not doing a service to yourself. Yeah. So, so I'd ask you is, is you know, over the length of your career, which is a nice, long, successful career, mm-hmm. um, what's been your key? You know, how do you connect with people? What's what's the thing you do that you bring to that first interaction? Yeah, well, first of all, that's um, it's it's both difficult and easy for me because I'm a natural introvert. I I I'm, I'm I if I go to a big conference somewhere, I really enjoy escaping to my room and answering emails <laughs> versus walking the halls and uh, talking to people. You and me both, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but that said, I think the introvert's advantage there is that we tend to be more curious people. It doesn't have to be you know the Andy Paul show. It doesn't have to be the Jeff Shore show. When I'm having a conversation. I, I really feel like I do know how to um, to listen attentively, to really listen between the lines, uh, to make my comments relatively few, to ask a lot of questions. I'm not particularly afraid to look stupid. Um, and, and so because of that, uh, I think... Except, I, except I for the fact keep... you wouldn't wear your, your earphones for for the yeah. conversation. But yeah, other than that... <laughs> I, I, I just... I, I just they, they look dumb. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but but I but but I do think that if I if I can look at it and say hey this isn't about me right if I'm talking to a potential client and I'm looking in and saying if I can't solve their problem I don't really shouldn't be here anyway and if I don't really understand their problem uh, uh, then I'm never gonna I I don't want to be all things to all people so you know I I always want to go in with that idea but let me just get to know you first and then we'll move from there mm-hmm. yeah I'm very similar I mean I'm a an introvert sure. also. Yep. I mean, I, yep. <laughs> sales was not a natural act for me when I first yep. got started. Right. Um, many a day I was in the early few months of my career, I was at home early looking at the walls, wondering what yep. I was, what I was doing. Right. Uh, and then, and then you and I, we'd go to sales training sessions and we'd have some stranger teaching us that what's it going to take to get you to just say this, what's it going to take to get you? And, you and well, I were like, ah, he's like running for the door. Yeah. Well, my example was in, in my first sales training class is we were watching these these films. This is <laughs> we didn't have video yet. We had films, yeah, uh, sales training films, and yeah, the the guy whose class we were taking, uh, it was looked like a yeah, you know, sort of a pro stereotypical movie version of a evangelical preacher, slick back hair, and the way he just talked and his you know his way of handling objections was. Right. was well, just suppose that wasn't an issue, right? So if you're saying, yeah, <laughs> I'll buy any car you want. I just need to have a black car. Well, just suppose we didn't have, you didn't want a black car. Would you buy this car? It's like, 
like, oh my God, that's that's what they're training us here is yeah. just suppose. Just was suppose. That, just suppose yeah. that wasn't important to you. Would you buy our product? Yeah, yeah. But, that, that's that's great if you're selling is in fantasy land, but in the real world, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah no, it, it, that one didn't transfer too well to uh, <laughs> to real life. Anyway, yeah. so what's another shortcut then? Uh, I love the idea of uh, price equals quality. Um, that if a if a customer is trying to size things up, uh, what happens uh, in their mind? Uh, they're 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 comparing items. Uh, we don't want to really fall into a commodity mindset. And so we run a little shortcut to look at it. And uh, psychologists have had a field day with this studying the wine section. I think psychologists spend a lot of time in wine section because you, know, you get invited to somebody's house for a dinner party. You're supposed to bring a host hostess gift. You go to buy some wine at the store. But suppose you have no idea what kind of wine, uh, what, what wine is, what a nice bottle is. And, and so then what do you do? Hey, uh, you ask price. yourself a very important question, and the question is, uh, how much do I like this person? Exactly. Right? How much How much do I want to impress this person? Because they're probably going to Google the wine after I leave, or at least that's what I do when somebody comes to my house. So <laughs> what kind of impression do I want to make? Hmm, now I know. And I'm looking and saying, well, you know, it's at my brother-in-law's. I'm bringing a, a box of, you know, uh, whatever it is, or a Boone's Farm Strawberry Whipple. But if I'm going to this executive, man, I got to look at it. I got to buy a decent bottle of wine. And I'm going to make my uh, decision almost entirely on price because, in my mind, price equals quality. And uh, I, a lot of vendors have figured this out. Many have not. There are there there is a mindset out there. Um, at, even at Shore Consulting, we internally we sort of joke about this idea that you know we are the high price leader. Nobody charges more than us. And if we find somebody who charges more, we'll gladly raise our price and add 10%. And we're not doing that to try and say, how do we just gouge people and charge? No, what we want to do here is that we want to provide so much value in what it is that we do that there's a price premium that goes along with it that people want to pay. And if they're looking for a discount on the type of services that we provide, then they're just simply not our customer. Mm -hmm. And there are people like that. If if you go into an, uh, a a uh, you know a Four Seasons or a Ritz Carlton and say, "Boy, you know, I can stay at this Sheraton over here for two hundred dollars less a night," they're not going to stand there and try and defend their value proposition against right. the, the you know. That's like this is if this is the experience that you want. This is the cost, and we naturally tend to look at it and say price equals quality, and we we follow that vein. I mean, there is an inverse to that, though, too. It's, you know, people look at price and just say it's too expensive, as you said, for the Sheraton and the the Four Seasons. So, sure. really, the task becomes for sellers is, you know, connecting your value to your price. Yes, and yeah. and this is why I find sort of interesting because I was just uh, reading something recently saying that uh, somebody is contending that the most effective time to bring up price was as late as possible. You know, in an interaction, and and I'm like, hmm. I said, yeah, I don't agree with that because you know, for me, you can only talk about value really in the context of price. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can people make an assessment of your value in the absence of knowing what the investment's going to be? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a it's a valid point because if people are going to buy emotionally, and we know that they are then as long as that price is the great unknown out there, it becomes very difficult for me to become vested emotionally. Mm -hmm. I'm going to guard myself. I'm going to guide or guard my own heart against, against jumping in with too much of my emotion because I might end up looking at the price and going, oh, my goodness, that's crazy. So I, I don't want to fall in love if I don't have a sense. So I, I agree. I'm a little uncomfortable about holding off too long and, and deferring on it and saying, we'll get to that, we'll get to that, we'll get to that, uh, to a customer who's trying to give some context for what that price is. And to your earlier point about the idea that, yeah, customers are sometimes going to say, well, your price is too high. Well, listen, if the price were a barrier that was insurmountable, if the price was a deal killer, you wouldn't be talking to them anyway. Most people don't, most customers don't want to continue the conversation if they've already eliminated you. Well, but it is absolutely the task of that sales professional to, to look at it and, and in a sense to say, damn straight, our price is high. You know, I mean, there's got to be some, and, and, and I can prove it to you. I can prove why that makes sense. 
so if, if that sales professional has the the confidence and the 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 presentation skills and the ability to step forward, then there should never be an apology for that high price. And they actually have an advantage to this because the customer's connection, their heuristic says that price equals quality. This is a high price. You better prove high quality. Go. Yeah. Well, I think that that when it comes to to price and those discussions is what people don't do enough is think about the fact that you what you do when you qualify a prospect, in my mind, and what's always worked for me and what, what I've done over my career is I qualify people on value. Mm-hmm. So part of that equation is for them to understand the value, they have to understand the price. Yeah. So and you have to be able to connect right. your price and your product and your service to the value they're going to receive. Right. And yeah. unfortunately, you know, people sort of qualify as that somebody, well, yeah, somebody wants something like ours, so they're they're obviously qualified. Sure. Yeah. Well, I know that they want well, are they qualified for the value that we're going to provide. Right. And if they're not, then they're not a prospect. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah, sure. Well, be, there's a flip side to price equals quality, and it's the discount equals distress. So if you're immediately saying, well, we can work with you on the price right out of the gate, and you have no desire to defend your price, if you don't defend your price, you're also not defending your quality, right? So uh, if you're if you're immediately going to give in along those lines, that your customer is going to, wait a minute, hold on a second, something's going on here. And there is that shortcut that says, if it's on sale, if it's easily discounted, there's something uh, that that is not quite adding up, and uh, that that quick discount is going to sniff out a little distress for your customer. Sure, because what they're going to think is, "Oh, they're so easy to give on price. What am I not going to get that they're promising?" Sure. Yep. Because absolutely, yep. I don't have the same margins anymore. Yeah. Yep. All right. So that was your next one on your list was discount yep. equals yep. distress. <laughs> well, here's 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 a question, and <laughs> I love throwing this out and having people. Uh, talk about it. because there is, I think, a prevalent mindset which is, God, you know, we're, our margins on our tech, the reps keep giving stuff away. Yep. And and I look at that and I say, hmm, no, actually, discounting is a manager's fault. It starts with them, mm-hmm. right? Is yep. unless you've given your reps free reign to set the price, which very few companies do, right? Um, that you know, I always <laughs> talk about that discounting arises out of a shortage, mm-hmm. right? We've got a shortage of something, which is, or a surplus of something. You mm-hmm. can look at it either way. You know, we have a yeah. surplus of products on the shelf, thus we right. need to discount to get them off. Right. Um, and so I, I think it's managers more than the reps that are really responsible for that. Yeah, look, a, a salesperson is their natural tendency is going to be I can sell an item if it's cheaper, right? They've they've got that commodity mindset, and uh, so what happens? Well, this is you know this is Kahneman, the, the law of least effort. People will always gravitate towards the easiest way to do something, and uh, the easiest way to sell something is at a lower price. So I don't think uh, the salespeople even really understand the damage that they often do when they throw it out there, because ultimately I, I, I like to talk about. What I refer to as value purity. People make the decision when they believe that the price is both fair and final. So if you're quickly throwing out this discount or this opportunity over here uh, without really defending why their quality is there or the mm-hmm. value is there in the first place, then I'm looking at it and I'm going, I'm not even sure that the price is fair, but I'm definitely sensing the price is not final. And here the, the value uh, plummeting has just begun. Yeah. No, I think that's a great perspective. That's a great mm-hmm. way to look at it. I, mean, I like that. All right, so last one on your list is, um, a little quickly because we're starting to run out of time, but sure, yeah. speed equals caring. Yeah, so this is the idea here about, uh, as a customer, when I have a request, when I need something from you, speed is the most critical component of whether or not you are handling my request properly. So when I'm, when I'm asking you for something, even if you can't fully execute on that, even that very fast response makes all the difference in the world. Speed shows that you're important. Speed shows that I care. When your customer makes a request, it is heavy on their mind. And the longer you wait to respond to that customer, the more likely it is you're giving room for that customer to ask the question, does this person really care? Mm-hmm. I, I think as it relates to request from your customer, follow up after the initial appointment, in all of these issues, speed equals caring. That's the shortcut that your customer is going to take. Yeah, now it's from someone, myself, who wrote a book called Zero Time Selling, which was all about responsiveness. Obviously, you, know, you, you know I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think the next level you take it to, 
because I absolutely agree on speed, is the next level though to take it to is what I call responsiveness, which is, yeah, you got to upskill yourself to the point where you can get back quickly with the complete information they need. Sure. When you, when you reach that state, then you're just locked in. Yeah. And people want to do business with you. You're, you become their their first choice. You become their emotional choice. You get to that point where, you know, I call it winning the sale before you win the order, which is that mm-hmm. go no go point. Yeah, yeah, you're you're the one that's in their mind at that point because they're saying, "Wow, if they're this good now, what are they going to be like once we we purchase something from them?" Sure. Yep. People make exactly. that extrapolation all the time. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So, and the and yep. the great thing about what I call responsiveness and the speed as you talk about as a salesperson, if you're listening to this and a manager, if you're trying to think about your culture as an organization, you have complete, absolute control over this. You know, there's, there's many things in sales you don't have control over. You don't have control over the product capabilities. You don't have control over the price. You got control over speed. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is a choice you make every time the opportunity comes up to respond to a customer or an inquiry or so on. If you don't prioritize it first, you're making a choice that it's not yeah. that important to you, and you're running, you're running the risk, and you're communicating that lack of caring to your prospect. Right. There's always a salesperson out there who is willing to beat you at the speed game if you're not careful here. Yeah. And you know, companies are prioritizing this. You know, companies as large as IBM have seen that this this is an issue. This lack of responsiveness. So, yeah, I just urge people <laughs> throughout my career. It has been huge, uh, yeah. and uh, as when I was, you know, for my first territory, even uh, as because, yeah, I was selling technical products. I didn't. <laughs> I was a history major. What I know, um, so I was compensating in yeah. some respects, right? But it, yeah. it paid off, and it didn't take long for the lesson to really sink in. It's like, yeah, people really appreciate this. Yeah, and, I encourage my uh, my clients to think about response time in terms of minutes, not hours. Yeah. And as do I. And mm-hmm. you know, one of the things that you know, if I'm on a plane and I, I get off the plane, I turn on my phone and I've got messages, it's like, oh gosh, you know, now, so now at least we have Wi Fi on a plane, mm-hmm. I can answer right. emails and so on. Yeah. But you know, I'll, I'll, when I call the person back, first thing I'll do is say, oh, I'm sorry it took me so long to get back to you. Yeah. And most people are like, what are you talking about? Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> a, you got back to them. B, you got back to them. Yeah. Even if it was a couple hours, you got back to them. And yeah, we've trained prospects. We've trained customers that no one is going to get back to them. And so they don't expect it. So when you do it, you differentiate yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Could not agree more. All right. Well, Jeff, unfortunately, we've run out of time. As always, a pleasure to talk with you. So uh, how can people find out more about you? Uh, it, it, everything can be found at jeffshore.com. It's uh, J-E-F-F-S-H-O-R-E, jeffshore.com. And that's uh, for the uh, uh, the podcast, The Buyer's Mind, which you've, of course, mm-hmm. been a guest on the show. Uh, uh, all of our books, everything that you need is right there, jeffshore.com. Excellent. All right, Jeff, thanks a lot. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Andy. Talk to you soon. Okay, friends, that was Accelerate for the week. First of all, I want to thank you for joining me. And I want to thank my guest, Jeff Shore. Join me again next week as I welcome Naftali Hoff to Accelerate. We're going to be talking about the critical distinctions between management and leadership and what this means specifically for sales. So thanks again to the Sales House for their ongoing support of Accelerate. If you want to get just a little smarter, a little more sales savvy every day, then join the Sales House. Visit thesaleshouse.com forward slash accelerate. And thanks again for joining me. Until next week, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone.